Hi everyone, welcome to this live webinar on programming for strength and hypertrophy. Uh, if you are watching this on replay, on delay, which I know most of you will be, uh, just jump forward to, to two minutes into this video and that's when I'll kick things off. So I'll just give a little bit of time for for those few people who are joining us live to, to jump on. As we go guys, please feel free to post any questions below wherever you're watching this video. Uh, I'll do my best to either respond to them as we go or I will respond to them after the, after the live feed. Again, today guys, we're talking about progressive overload techniques for strength and hypertrophy, uh, how we can use training techniques for a whole range of different levels and abilities to be able to to improve these, these elements of training, these strength and hypertrophy elements of training. Again, guys, we'll give another 60 seconds for anyone to jump on who is joining us live. Uh, again, if you are not watching this live, please feel free to skip forward to two minutes when we will kick things off in, in earnest. 45 seconds, guys, and we'll get started. Again, please feel free to leave comments as we go here. If you have any questions or comments, again, I'll respond to them either during the feed or following the feed today. There will be some notes available as well uh, on on-screen presentation. However, if you if you would like more detailed notes, please do let me know as I have everything available uh, in multiple formats that that will be of interest or of use to you as well. Give it 10 seconds, guys, and we'll kick things off. Okay, welcome to this live webinar on strength and hypertrophy training, programming for strength and hypertrophy. My name is Dan Williams. I'm an accredited exercise physiologist from Range of Motion in, in Perth. And I wanna take you through some of the techniques that you can use with your clients for improving strength and hypertrophy today. Please feel free to post questions below, ask questions as we go. I realize most of you are watching this on a delay, um, so that's fine. I will get to those questions even if you're not posting them straight away. Uh, so let's um, let's kick off. I am going to do my best to do some some screen share stuff as well as we go with some of these elements where it is it is appropriate to do that screen share. Um, but otherwise, let's let's jump right in. So one of the key concepts that I think we need to talk about is what I call the black box of programming. And the concept here is that as much as we know a lot about the human body and a lot about how it works and how it responds to certain stimuli, a lot of it is a black box. And what I mean by that is, here's a big black box. You can't see what's inside it. We know that we have some inputs going into that big black box. We have some strength, some, some sets, some reps, some exercise selection. And then we know that coming out the other end of that big black box is improved strength, improved hypertrophy, increased cross-sectional area of muscles. And we know some of what goes on inside that box, but a lot we actually don't know. So it's important to remember here that this is, this is less hard and fast science and data, which to be honest, doesn't exist. And this is more, we know the inputs, we know the outputs, we're not exactly sure what's happening inside, but this is a good way to be able to manage and get as much benefit as we can from inside that black box. So exercise physiology is an imperfect science. It's not like, chemistry or physics where there are equations that, that work all the time. So while we know the input, we know the output, a lot of the mechanisms are poorly understood. So we need to be able to vary the input to be able to create an environment where we're getting as much out of that black box as possible. How do we vary it? We vary it by load, we vary it by movement speed, by how many reps we're doing, by sets, by time under tension, by frequency of training and by things like rest. We can, we can change and modify all of these different things based on the fact that we don't actually know what's happening inside that box. There are three laws that I wanna to talk to you about, and you'll probably be familiar with these because this is a, a mainstay of any sort of education for anyone who's working in the health or fitness space. So obviously we have a whole bunch of different laws of strength training. There are three I wanna talk about today. The first is progressive overload. If you do more than what your body is currently adapted to, your body will adapt in some way to cause an adaptation. In the, 
In the sphere of strength and hypertrophy training, your body will adapt by becoming stronger and by increasing the cross-sectional area or the size of muscles to be able to respond to the stimulus that you're placing on it. The second law I want to talk about is that of specificity. And of course, specificity says that if you want to get better at deadlifts, you get better at deadlifts by doing deadlifts. If you want to get better at bench, you, you do more bench press. You will improve at the things you are specifically working on. And sure, there is, if you work on a conventional deadlift, it's going to improve your sumo. It's going to improve a trap bar deadlift. It's going to improve a low bar back squat. Hell, it's even going to improve a high bar back squat or a front squat to some respect. But if you want to get very good at deadlifts, then doing deadlifts is what's going to have the greatest effect for you. And finally, the law of reversibility and maintenance. And this is probably the most important of all. And this basically says that anything that you can gain or develop through some form of strength training can also be lost by removing that strength training. The reason I think this is the most important law of these three that I'm talking about is that this this really implores that importance of consistency. And we know this, we know that consistency is important, but if it can be gained, it can also be lost. So let's for a moment put aside this black box model where we don't know what's happening inside this box and we can draw a few different conclusions. So that aside, here is what we know about some of the techniques that are gonna be the most effective ways of developing strength and hypertrophy in yourself or with your clients. So first I wanna talk about the conjugate method. And the conjugate method is a method of strength training that was really popularized and brought into the Western world by Louis Simmons. So Louis Simmons, who passed away in the last couple of years, um, he was the owner and founder of Westside Barbell, which was at the time and still to some degree, unequivocally accepted as one of the strongest strength training facilities on the planet. Obviously focusing on powerlifting and using powerlifting as an adjunct to help people improve their chosen sports. And to understand how this works, basically what Louis did is he took all of these old Soviet texts, had them translated into English, and then used all of this old Soviet era research as the foundations of how he programmed strength training. And there are a few things to talk about because there are three different areas that, that really comprise the, the area of conjugate programming. The first is dynamic effort, the second is max effort, and the third is accessory work. So let's break down those three areas and talk about how you can use them to improve strength and hypertrophy. First, let's talk about dynamic effort, and this is very much based around speed. All right, so let's look into an equation for power first. So power is force multiplied by distance divided by time. That's the equation for power. And when we are doing doing work to try and improve your strength through the conjugate method, using the dynamic method is extremely important because we don't only wanna be able to move heavy weights, we wanna be able to move them fast. Let's break down that equation. So power equals force multiplied by distance, which means that we want a lot of force and a long distance. We wanna be moving a large load a long distance. However, that is then divided by time, so we need to be doing that quickly. So you could do a deadlift, a slow grinding heavy deadlift, and you're not gonna get as much benefit for speed as you would if that were done faster. So we're basically playing with those variables. How, how high can we keep the load while at the same time ensuring that the speed stays high? If we compromise on either of those, if the load is very low, speed will be extremely high and we're still training power, but it's a different part of that power curve. If the load is very high and the speed is low, again, we aren't training power, we're training absolute strength, max strength, which is the other end of that power curve. So it's important to have both. For most people in most movements, you're gonna be looking at about 65% of your max in terms of the sort of loadage that you should be doing for your dynamic effort work. And an example of the sort of reps and sets for this, you maybe would go 10 sets of two with plenty of breaks, and maybe every minute you do two reps, almost like a cluster style, but with a longer break there. You'll do two reps, very, very fast, light enough that you can move quickly, but heavy enough that you do have to put the work in. But movement speed, bar speed here is key. Now, I think, and this wasn't traditionally used in the conjugate method and by Louis Simmons in particular, but Olympic weightlifting would really tick the box on this dynamic effort work. Any sort of explosive plyometric type barbell work, something like a jumping trap bar deadlift, uh, a jumping high bar back squat, is gonna tick the box on this dynamic effort work because there is some weight behind it, but it is also fast. So let's move from the dynamic effort work into the max effort work. So max effort work is now where we are allowing speed to drop 
and the the intent is still to move fast. The intent should always be to move fast in your warm up sets, in your actual work sets. The intent is always to move fast. However, with max effort work, it is going to be slower as a result of the load being higher. This is less about power production, which is what we were focusing on in the dynamic effort work, and more about lifting a very heavy weight. So we talked about the dynamic effort work and we talked about max effort. Let's now talk about accessory work, which is the third element of the conjugate method. Accessory work, I would question whether that is useful for a generalist. What do I mean by a generalist? This is someone who just wants a broad competency across multiple different elements of health and fitness. So a lot of our clients, they're not necessarily looking to become competitive powerlifters. If they are, accessory work is great. And this is basically where we say, it's my triceps that let me down in a bench press, so I'm going to isolate them. It's my lats that let me down in a bench press, so I'm going to isolate them. Doing accessory work to work on that. However, if you are someone or if you are training someone, if you're coaching someone who is using strength training as a way to get strong for life, for health, as opposed to a way to get strong to, to have the highest platform total that they can, then, then I would question the need for this accessory work because they're probably doing other methods of training at the same time. They're probably using some sort of concurrent training where yes, they're doing some strength work, but they're also doing some cardiorespiratory conditioning, maybe some higher intensity work, maybe some calisthenic or body weight type movements as well. So in my opinion, for a generalist population who's looking to build a general competency, I don't think you need to be including accessory work as part of your, your strength or your powerlifting training, because I think that box is gonna be ticked in the other areas of their training, assuming again that they are doing some form of concurrent training. So just make sure that when you are choosing their programming outside their strength work, it's gonna be hitting some of those weak points. If there are certain weaknesses and certain movement patterns that you are choosing movements that are gonna be conducive to improving those. All right, let's, let's talk about accommodating resistance. So this is something that I would include in your dynamic effort work as part of the conjugate method. This is basically where we are, we're trying to improve strength in a particular range, a particular section or segment of that full range of motion. So let's look at something like a deadlift, for example. If someone's doing a deadlift, they struggle to get the bar off the ground, let's say. So you're probably gonna fall into one or two categories. You will either struggle to break the bar off the ground or you will struggle with that final lockout above the knee. Let's assume that this particular individual is able to break the bar from the ground, no problem, but they get past their knee and without hiking and hitching that bar up their legs, they're unable to lock out the deadlift. We've identified a certain section or segment of that range which is a struggle for them. And this is where accommodating resistance comes in. This is basically where we are lifting a different load at different portions of the lift. For example, using this deadlift example, if you were to do banded deadlifts, so you have bands that are applying no extra load to the bar when the bar is set on the ground, but the more you stand up that deadlift, the more the band is going to stretch, the more force is being applied by that band to the bar and the heavier effectively your bar becomes. So maybe as you're set up in the bottom of a deadlift, you have 40% of your max on the bar, but when you stand up and lock out that deadlift, because of the added resistance from the band, you're now maybe looking at 60 to 70% of your max is on that bar. You can see how this is useful for someone who has a weak point at the top of their deadlift, because you're ensuring that at the top, more work is being done, and that is when more work needs to be done. Now, often with a deadlift, people are neglecting that lockout, that end of range. If you are someone who can lock out fine, but struggles to get the bar off the ground, being able to get the bar off the ground is the struggle. You get it to your knees, and honestly, you sort of switch off a little bit. You don't have that intent to develop the speed and power at the end of range. Once you pass your knees, you just sort of use momentum to cruise through to the end of the deadlift. We add some bands, however, and we increase the onus on the body to be able to produce force at that point, and you have to work harder at the top. You have to work harder in a range which is often being neglected. A couple of other examples that, that we use at Range of Motion of using this dynamic effort, explosive work, this accommodating resistance, is we'll do a jumping trap bar deadlift. Any jumping explosive stuff is really gonna be beneficial here. These ballistic movements are, are highly beneficial because again, if you're doing a jumping trap bar deadlift, not only are you not slowing down at end of range, but you're exploding beyond the end of range. Again, building explosiveness, power and speed, not just strength. 
You could do jumping high bar back squats, the same sort of idea. You could do banded bench press. You could put a band on your squats. You could do some sort of external loading uh, ballistic work like heavy ball throws. Again, we wanna be around 65% of the max. 65% of the max at the heaviest. So if you're doing a deadlift, the top of the deadlift is when you're about 65%. The bottom of the deadlift when you're set is gonna be closer to about 40%. So being able to use this accommodating resistance, 40% band weight plus 25% band tension at the top is gonna to be a great way to build your power and improve your overall strength. Let's move from accommodating resistance and talk about eccentric training. Now eccentric training, as you guys know, is overloading or training that lowering eccentric negative phase of a movement. So let's look at an example like a bench press here. Eccentric training is working on the lowering of the bar and all of the strength benefits that that creates. And on average in the research, most people on average across most movements on average are gonna be able to lower under control about 40% more than they can lift. If you can bench press 100 kilos, you can probably lower 140 kilos under control before gravity starts to win that battle. A few different ways that we can do eccentrics. I'll start with the ways that I think most people are using and then we'll go on to a way that I think a lot of people are not using but it's much more powerful as an eccentric strength and hypertrophy training technique. So let's start with the use of tempos. So a lot of people will overload an eccentric by slowing down that eccentric phase and then moving quickly through a concentric phase. Using our example of the bench press, someone does a slow five second lower to overload that eccentric phase and then moves fast on the concentric phase. Let's say they're doing a set of five of those. Now this is great. The issue here, however, and it's still gonna potentially give you more strength than if you're just busting out those reps with a fast eccentric, the issue here, however, is that that individual is being limited by their concentric strength. So if you're doing eccentric training on your own, you do that slow lower, you're not gonna hit failure on that slow lower. Let's say you're doing a five second eccentric. You're not gonna fail halfway through that five second eccentric. You are gonna fail first on that fast concentric that you're trying to do. So in actuality, we're not really training the eccentric strength as much as we could. We're still training that concentric strength and we're leaving some of those strength and muscle gains um, on the table. So what's the alternative to that? Well, we use a method called accentuated eccentric training. And this is where we are avoiding or neglecting as much as possible that concentric phase and doing only the eccentric. Now in a perfect world, what that looks like, the bar is unracked, that slow five second lower, and then full 100% assistance on the lift, on the concentric. So you maybe have someone on each end of the bar and they lift the weight for you. Slow five second eccentric, they lift the weight for you. So you're no longer being limited by your ability to do that, that concentric portion of the lift. All of the overload, all of the progressive overload is happening eccentrically. Practically, this can be difficult to do. Again, we will do this with bench press. You can have a single spotter as long as they've got a good amount of strength uh, and that's gonna minimize the amount of concentric contraction that the individual is doing. He's actually doing the reps. Um, we, we will do this with a squat. So if someone's doing a back squat, we're able to spot from behind and again, do as much of that work as possible. Um, on a deadlift, it's trickier with a single spotter. Ideally, with these, you, you would have one person on, on each end of the bar. And there are things you can do like having weight releases where someone is going to do a slow lower. There's a contraption on each end of the bar that drops a little bit of weight off, which makes the concentric easier. Uh, but again, it's a little clumsy and it's tough if you're doing more than one rep of those. You could do a slow lower and then drop the bar if you're doing something like a back squat. Um, so you could do your slow lower and then jettison the bar off your back and dive forward. But again, tricky if you are trying to do multiple reps here. Um, there are a few devices on the market which are actually using engines or motors inside this device to be able to, to have a different load on the way down and on the way up. Um, but they do tend to be expensive and not ultra accessible to most people, but you should be using some form of eccentric training. Let's talk about load selection. One of the big issues I have with a lot of strength programming and training is the fact that a lot of people will program ultra specific percentages. So it will be um, five sets of three back squats at 
87.5%, which is ultra specific. And then um, for the bench press, it's gonna be X number of X reps at uh, 68%. And they're all very specific. The body just doesn't work like that. Even if we are programming different percentages for different individuals, it doesn't work like that. A lot of people have a different levels of activation patterns. Some people have very high neuro muscular efficiency, some people low. So if you've got high neuromuscular efficiency, you're probably not gonna be able to do your sets at as high a weight, because when you're going for a one rep max, you're able to innovate to turn on a huge percentage of your motor units, of your muscle fibers. Someone who's maybe more of an endurance-based athlete, they can't bench press as much, they can't squat or deadlift as much, but you give them 95% of their max and they're gonna be busting out six, seven, eight reps. They have low neuromuscular efficiency. So a percentage doesn't work. The best way, in my opinion, to do this is to make this based on auto-regulation. Auto-regulation where you say, this should be very, very heavy, and there are multiple scales you can use, or this should be at a moderate weight, or this should feel eight out of 10 in terms of the difficulty. If you can do that, what may feel like an eight out of 10 for someone today is not gonna feel like an eight or 10 uh, for someone tomorrow when there's maybe high levels of neuromuscular fatigue, when there are other stresses going on in their life, when they're dehydrated, when they're not sleeping well, etc. So if you can use auto-regulation, a certain number instead of being percentage-based or instead of being, I have to list, lift X kilos. Most of the research is telling us that there's a 4% increase or improvement in strength as a result of a, a training program which is reliant on auto-regulation as opposed to reliant on a certain weight or a certain percentage. Um, Load variation is really important here, being able to use lots of different loads, lots of different weights, lots of different rep schemes. So let's dig into that a little bit more. The, the old method of strength, hypertrophy, peak strength, strength endurance, was very much that if you're trying to build endurance-based strength, you should be doing a lower load for high reps. And the law of specificity would tell us that that's true. You wanna build endurance, you do endurance-based work. It would say that if you wanna do muscle hypertrophy, you wanna be working in that, that sort of stereotypical eight to 12 rep scheme, yeah? If you're doing eight to 12 reps and you're working hard and there's maybe two minutes between sets, the old school would tell us that that is optimal for hypertrophy. And then it would say, if you wanna get strong, we need to go to the other end of the continuum and do very heavy stuff for very low numbers of reps. Now, there's a little bit of truth to this, but instead of that endurance strength, muscle hypertrophy, peak strength in three very distinct different categories, what common wisdom and what a lot of the research now is showing is that it's a little bit more of a sliding scale. So. If you are doing lower weight, lower load, high rep stuff, that's still gonna be best for endurance strength because of the law of specificity and because of changes in muscle fiber type, not the numbers and, the, and certain percentages of muscle fiber type, but because of the changes in muscle fiber type in things like mitochondrial density that come about as a result of this lighter, higher rep endurance-based training. So that's still gonna ring true. However, if you wanna improve your endurance strength, doing very heavy high loads with low reps is also gonna benefit that. You're not gonna be, be losing a benefit just because you're going heavy. If we look at peak strength, conventional wisdom is you have to go very heavy to develop your peak strength. However, doing lower loads for high numbers of reps is still gonna improve your peak strength. So instead of it being a this is what you do to get this, this is what you do to get this. It's very much a sliding scale where yes, one is better than the other, but you are still gonna be getting a benefit. And if we think back to that black box, it's important that we are ticking all the boxes to get as much benefit as possible. Let's talk about hypertrophy, however. Hypertrophy, that standard eight to 12 rep scheme where the muscles are burning, you're getting that pump and you're not resting for full recovery in between. The research now is saying that no, eight to 12 reps for hypertrophy is not the best place to be. It's much more reliant on total volume, time under tension, intensities. So if you want to get bigger muscles, if you want to improve cross-sectional area, which is a major determinant of strength as well, sometimes you need to be going very heavy for low reps, like that five, five by five type thing, where it's heavy and where you're resting for almost full recovery in between, training as a power lifter would. 
Sometimes you want to be going really light for a very high number of reps where you're talking 20, 30 plus reps at certain times. And sometimes you want to be in that middle range, in that, that eight to 12 rep range that traditionally we have been taught is, is optimal for hypertrophy. So this is sort of good because it tells us that it doesn't have to be perfect. We don't have to be in these perfect rep ranges, these perfect percentages. The benefit for hypertrophy comes from a huge amount of variation uh, of loads, of rep schemes, and of movement types. Let's talk about movement types. Let's talk about the exercise selection. It's very important to have a lot of variety. First, to keep people fresh. If you are working with an athletic population who are paid to get strong, it is their job. Exercise variety is not important from a novelty value point of thing because they just need to do the work. You don't really care if they're having a good time or not. But even with those people, you're gonna get much higher buy-in and retention and consistency from someone if there is a little bit of variety. So exercise variety is important because a broad stimulus provides a broad range of applications. If you think of a whole bunch of circles overlapping each other, a really complicated Venn diagram, like I said at the start, a back squat is going to improve a deadlift. Hey, a back squat is even gonna improve a bench press, even though it doesn't look like they're similar movement patterns, muscle activation types, there is a hormonal effect, which is gonna cause that to happen, but there's also a localized effect in the periphery, which is gonna allow that to happen. Um, for example, the lat activation patterns in a bench press and a deadlift, although they look very different at face value, are actually pretty similar. Your lats are gonna be used a huge amount in both of those movements. So. Broad stimulus, lots of different movements because broad stimulus is gonna give us broad applications and a broad adaptation. Um, I, would, I would make sure that you're ticking three boxes with your strength programming. This should be something that is more press-based. So maybe that's gonna be um, some form of bench press with a certain type of bar and a variety of bars, some form of overhead strict pressing, um, even loaded heavy dips are gonna be good movements as well. So some sort of press, some sort of squat, and again, you can choose and vary up what type of squat it's gonna be. Maybe you're, you're high bar squatting, maybe you're low bar back squatting, um, maybe you're doing front squats, maybe you're doing overhead squats, maybe you're doing Zerka squats, maybe you're using different objects for the squats. Um, having a huge amount of variety, but making sure there's some form of squat as well as some form of press. And then some form of pull, and traditionally that would be some, some element of deadlift, be it a sumo, a conventional, a deficit, a rack pull, um, and then slightly smaller muscle groups, something like a bench pull as well would also come under that category. So if we're trying to minimize this and say, let's get as much bang for our buck as we can, and we're not gonna be spending a lot of our time on accessory work, just make sure that you're choosing movements from each of those, each of those categories. Something where you're pressing heavy, something where you're pulling heavy, something where you're squatting heavy. Um, let's talk about efficiency, because particularly for those of you who are working with a general population, efficiency becomes important because you don't necessarily have two hours a day to strength train with these people. So if you're a multi-sport athlete, if you're a generalist who's doing other forms of training as well, this is really, really important. You also need to consider the fact that if you are training someone who's training multiple different elements and facets of their fitness, they probably have higher recoverability than someone who is just a pure meathead strength athlete only. Someone who is only only training heavy powerlifting, for example, they, they probably don't have the recoverability because they don't have the cardiorespiratory capacity to be able to recover from the work they've just done. So if someone is also training other general elements of cardiorespiratory fitness, we can actually either reduce the time between sets because their recovery is faster, or we can play some games where we're alternating different muscle groups and different movement types. So let me give you an example of what that would look like. And I'd like to take you through two sample sessions that, that I would program for someone who's looking to build strength. One is based more on that conjugate method type approach, and the other is based more on the accentuated eccentric training sort of approach. But these are both taking into, into consideration the fact that we're probably training a generalist athlete, and we're probably training someone who has levels of aerobic capacity, which are gonna allow us to do some little tricks and some little tweaks to the programming. So let's, let's talk about a session that I would program using the conjugate method. And again, we're gonna disregard any sort of accessory work at the moment. So I'll break this into two parts. Part A, we're gonna be focusing on accommodating resistance. 
And for part A, I'm gonna choose a squat-based movement. Now, purist powerlifters who are following the conjugate method will have, uh, for example, an upper body speed day, and then a lower body strength day, and then maybe an upper body strength day. So they're gonna alternate doing their max effort um, and doing their dynamic effort on different days, maybe with some, some accessory work on all days. But because of the time constraints, the efficiency that we're looking for here, we're gonna roll the max effort work and the dynamic effort work, the speed work into the same session. So part A, every 30 seconds for five minutes, we're gonna do two speed box squats with 40% of the athlete's max load on the bar and 25% band resistance at the top. So they're doing their box squats. It's a little lighter down the bottom. It's a little heavier up the top for reasons that we've already spoken about. That's part A. It's gonna take about five minutes. Then two minute rest and we go into part B. We've done the squat base movement. We're gonna now move into a pull base movement and a press base movement. So let's choose movements like deadlifts and strict press. Those are gonna be our two. We're gonna do five deadlifts. Two minutes later, we're gonna do three strict press. Two minutes later, we'll do five deadlifts. Two minutes later, we'll do two strict press. And we'll do five rounds of that. Five rounds of deads, five rounds of strict press. What's happening here? Let's say that those five deadlifts, when you should be stopping and resetting each one, these are not touch and go, nor are the strict press off the shoulders. Let's say that those five deadlifts take 20 seconds to do. If you were doing a set of deadlifts every three minutes, it then means that you're resting two minutes 40. And that's quite an inefficient way to train this. However, because two minutes later we're doing a strict press, there's very little muscular overlap between what a deadlift is doing and what a strict press is doing. So you don't have that localized peripheral fatigue where your deadlifts are fatiguing you and compromising your ability to strict press heavy. Now you're doing deadlifts every four minutes instead of every two. So instead of that shorter break, we have a longer break in between the sets of deadlifts. So you're still getting that localized peripheral recovery. And again, the systemic effect, the systemic fatigue that you're getting from this is gonna be minimized because again, we're talking about individuals who are training multiple different elements of fitness at one time, okay? So that's an example of what I would do for a conjugate method type approach. If we look at um, an eccentric style session, and again, we're gonna talk about accentuated eccentric training here, I'm still, going to go on a, uh, I'm still going to want to have those three different areas. Something that's very press-based, squat-based, and pull-based. But in this session, I'm going to break up that pull-based movement into something that's more lower body, posterior chain. We're going to do a deadlift. And something that's more upper body, posterior chain, we're going to do a bench pull. So here's what this is going to look like. We're going to have movements A1 and A2. A1 is a deadlift. So you're going to do five by five accentuated eccentric lowers. Slow five second lower, full assistance on the lift. If you can't do that, if you don't have that assistance, if you don't have that spot, and ideally that two person spot on each end, if you can't do that, we're gonna do tempo. So it's a slow five second lower and then a lift. For this, we wanna be looking at at least 75%, but again, it's gonna be based more on RPE here. At least 75% if you have a spot, on this, um, sorry, at least 75% if you are just doing tempo. If you do have a spot, we're looking at 90% of your max for five reps with that slow five second eccentric, again with full assistance. So you're gonna do five eccentric deadlifts. You're gonna rest for two and a half minutes and then you're gonna do the same thing for bench press. And again, the impact between a deadlift and a bench press, although there's some lat activation overlap, is not gonna be huge. It's not like we're going from a deadlift into a back squat where there is much more overlap. And you can do the same thing for your bench press. You're then gonna rest at two and a half minutes, you'll do deadlifts, then bench press, deadlift, then bench press, three sets. Moving on to the second bit of this, for B1 and B2. And guys, if you're getting lost in, in any of this, let me know and I'll post screenshots of these sessions below this video. You're gonna do front squats and you're gonna do bench pull. Same thing, same loads in terms of the percentages or thereabouts, the RPA, alternating between the two. This is under half an hour, this strength session. And in this time, you are doing 15 reps of four different movements, that is three sets of five, and you will get a huge amount of overload. Again, this is not how you would train if you are only a strength athlete doing only strength. This is not how you would train a powerlifter. But for a general population or people who are using multiple elements of fitness at any one time, it's a really good way to go. So that's basically the overview. 
In terms of programming for strength, the big picture, an approach that I would take, I would be looking at alternating the strength sessions in uh, between something that's more conjugate method based and then something that's more slow tempo eccentric, ideally accentuated eccentric training uh, based. If someone's doing strength training three times a week, Monday could be conjugate, Wednesday could be eccentric, Friday could be conjugate, Monday could be eccentric, etc. Cycling through that is gonna work well. Again, hedging our bets and having these multiple elements of training is very important when it comes down to that black box model. Include some Olympic lifting in that as well. We spoke about the improved benefits of Olympic lifting for speed and power. Make sure that the training is including elements of some sort of pull, some sort of squat, some sort of press. And again, that pull could be broken down into more posterior chain lower body and more posterior chain upper body. Lower body being more like a deadlift, upper body being more like a bench pull. I know that there's plenty of upper body activation in a deadlift, but that bench pull is a very strong horizontal pulling movement. I would be including of those three elements, the squat, the pull, and the press, I'd be doing some sort of dynamic effort work for each, some sort of max effort work for each, and some sort of eccentric work for each. In terms of the rep schemes, again, we spoke about the importance of very high rep stuff as well as lower rep stuff. So the range is really important here, but for, for pure strength, we're on the lower end of the rep scheme, I would say five reps and below, as long as you're working those more moderate and higher rep schemes as the other part of their training. For time efficiency, as we spoke about, I like that alternating pattern where you're alternating an A1 and an A2 and going between them. And as you do that, making sure that there's not a big overlap of muscle activation patterns between those two. You don't wanna be going a strict press and a bench press as two movements that are alternating each other, unless, unless the intent of your session is to improve localized muscular stamina as opposed to strength and hypertrophy. And again, in terms of loads, auto regulation here is key. Guys, if you can follow these guidelines for strength training, you will find that improved strength, improved hypertrophy are gonna be maximized, but also maximized based on the, the individual needs and the life of, of you on the life of our clients. Because in the end, you have to meet people where they are. Guys, I hope this has been of use. If you're interested in any more details on this, let me know and I'll send you info. Uh, if you're interested in the internships we run where you learn this at Range of Motion, on the floor, on the ground, as we work through it with our clients, please reach out to me as well. Guys, you can learn more about what we do, rangeofmotion.net.au. You can contact me direct, dan at rangeofmotion.net.au. See you soon.